I believe that someday something good will come to me and I believe that one day life will undo what it's done to me cause I believe yes I believe so strongly that it's true someday the world will treat me just like you I wrote those lyrics when I was 17. Try to imagine the 17 year old who writes a song about hope and healing. Do you see her leather jacket and black nail polish? Her mini skirt and knee high boots? Maybe you pictured her hanging out with friends, people like this guy. This is Nathan, one of the few people from high school I'm still in touch with. I met him sophomore year, health class, school number 12. The teacher had just told us that people who attempt suicide don't really want to die. I didn't tell her I needed to believe that family and friends who'd killed themselves were better off because I didn't know then, that's why I believed it. But I did tell her, I know a girl who swallowed two bottles of pills, and when she woke up the next morning, she was just pissed it didn't work. Maybe the teacher knew I was talking about myself. Maybe she thought I was just being dramatic. But Nathan passed me a note that said, I know the girl who didn't want to wake up. We became friends because like me, Nathan knew hope was a dirty word. We're still friends because we survived anyway. When I think back to the 17 year old me who wrote that song, I see her cradling her infant daughter, a dollar store wedding ring peeking from under the blanket. That's the girl the principal called into the office two months before graduation to say she had too, too many unexcused absences to finish with her class. Shouldn't you be at home with your little girl anyway, he asked. I had a 3.83 GPA, a perfect ACT score, and three scholarship offers. But I also had a baby had spent time in a temporary home while the courts tried to figure out what to do with me and had gotten married to solve that problem. I did have a little bit of self-respect and I did what any self-respecting poor kid would do. I gave the principal the bird and dropped out. I left school knowing three things with certainty. You can't buy pre-cooked food with food stamps. Huh? A welfare check will never be enough to cover the whole rent, but a penny too much in wages will cost whatever food you can buy. And the world measures poverty, not potential. According to the National Council on State Legislatures, 60% of teen moms drop out of high school and fewer than 2% finish college. An Institute for Educational Statistics report shows students in poverty are five times more likely to drop out than their peers. Add in that Rumberger and other educational researchers have shown that school mobility increases the risk of dropping out and it's clear I was statistically destined to fail. The woman standing in front of you today was never supposed to exist. I am a wife of 20 years mother to three college students, a homeowner, a published writer, a high school teacher, and a doctoral candidate. Three years ago, I didn't know what a doctoral candidate was. When people hear my story, they often say things that make me uncomfortable. They say I must be very strong or very brave, or the worst, I am proof that anyone can do anything they put their mind to, as if I did it all without help through sheer force of will. I've heard my intelligence must be responsible for my success, but 
I'm a teacher, and I voluntarily go back to high school every day. <laughs> Saying that success comes from someone's personal characteristics creates two problems. First, if I believe that success comes from some innate quality, I have no responsibility to help others because nothing I do will matter. It gives me a way to sort out who should get help and who shouldn't, and it implies that there's some group of people who should never be expected to succeed. Second, if I believe that success comes from someone's extreme intelligence or strength or talent or whatever, I have no responsibility to help myself because nothing I do will matter. At that point, I'm saving my self-respect and sanity by becoming very, very comfortable with a lack of success. And this is the root of what some people call the poverty culture. I'm convinced that I've been able to achieve what I have because there were people who believed enough in me to make me believe enough in myself to make the sacrifices necessary to create a better life. Small sacrifices, like never learning to read and write music. Big sacrifices, like missing my kids' activities because I was doing homework after coming home from work. I created a framework to help explain the kinds of actions people took that were most helpful to me. And I call them future seats. These are selfless, equalizing, deliberate actions that show an expectation for future success. Let me explain. When we think about how to help people win poverty, we often think about acts of charity. Now, acts of charity meet a right now need. They're not equalizing. They're someone doing something for someone else. There's no expectation that that imbalance will change. Often, we perform these kinds of acts impulsively. We donate a little food or money in the same way that we might add a candy bar to our groceries while we stand in line. In contrast, future seeds show that other person that we expect as much from them as we do from ourselves and vice versa. Decades of research on Vroom's expectancy theory show that our expectations matter a lot. A simplified explanation is, if I believe that the outcome of my efforts will be positive, okay, I'll put more effort into the work that I do. But if I believe that the outcomes of my efforts will be negative or neutral, as in having food today doesn't stop me from being hungry tomorrow, I'm not motivated to do my best. The theory was introduced in the 60s to help explain workplace behavior, but it can also explain life behavior when we add it to the concept of stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is another very well-researched idea that shows people perform less effectively on a task if they're first reminded that they belong to some group, race, gender, in my case, socioeconomic status, that doesn't usually perform well on that task, like, say, graduating high school. Huh? The power of positive expectations for my success helped me overcome stereotype threat that started in the sixth grade when the teacher told us we were going to help students less fortunate than ourselves by packing boxes of school supplies and school clothes for a big giveaway that was coming up. I already knew about the giveaway because I was really looking forward to getting a pair of pants that wore high waters. And in that moment, I realized that I was never expected to be in an honors class. But I was there. Because in fourth grade, a teacher interpreted my naughtiness, it was a little bit, as boredom rather than a disciplinary issue. She had me evaluated and placed in the talented and gifted program. Like many poor kids, I moved a lot. And that talented and gifted label followed me from school to school to school. 
making sure that educators always saw my potential before they saw my poverty. Usually, I move too quickly for them to find anything else. The principal that I mentioned earlier was from school number 15. This was a school where the first thing anyone learned about me was that I was 16, poor, and pregnant. But Mr. Woodworth was also at that school. He saw all the same things that everyone else did. He just didn't treat me any differently. The last assignment that I completed for Mr. Woodworth was to read, analyze, and present my analysis of Aristotle's poetics to the class in three to four minutes. <laughs> for the first part of the assignment, I was in a temporary home and in and out of court. For the second part of the assignment, I was on what passes for a 17-year-old's honeymoon. So my presentation came out something like this. Aristotle says the beginning is the beginning and the end is the end. I have no idea why anyone would read this or why it matters. <laughs> Mr. Woodworth's response, a note next to the F on the turned in portion of the assignment that said, you can do so much more and I expect you to. Mr. Woodworth took the time to let me know he didn't believe that my current circumstances could interfere with me reaching my potential. A couple days later, I dropped out, and that was the last thing Mr. Woodworth heard from me for 20 years. But his words, you can do so much more, and I expect you to, that came back to me a couple years later when I left my first husband and remembered that I believed in a better world. Someone I admired thought I was capable and I wanted to prove him right. So I went to an alternative school for the last two credits of my high school diploma instead of getting a GED. I knew the English teacher at that alternative school for fewer than four months. I don't remember her name but I can picture her clearly because of her future seed. After grading my incoming assessment, she asked me what college I was going to. And I said, people like me don't go to college. She didn't say anything right then, but a couple weeks later, she passed back an essay I'd written, pointed at the A on top, and told me she had asked a community college professor to grade it. People like you have a responsibility to go to college, she said. Now, this act was selfless on the part of both that alternative school teacher and the anonymous community college professor. We teachers, this will surprise you, we do not run around going, please, please, someone give me more work to grade. It was equalizing. It showed me that I was equal to any other student on that college campus. It was deliberate and planned, even though she had no way of knowing whether or not it would work. And it showed an expectation for my future success. She didn't say, of course you can go to college. She didn't even say, you should go to college. She said, you have a responsibility to go to college. People planted dozens of future seeds for me throughout my life. And this is important because just like the effects of poverty are cumulative, the effects of future seeds stack on each other over time. Even today, I deal with poverty-related issues. Some followed me from that old life, like stereotype threat that had me bawling like a baby during every statistics quiz in a class I passed with a 98.2%. Some are new problems, like realizing the parts and people from my past don't fit neatly with the parts and people in my future. Even so, future seeds have become the foundation for the kind of teacher and person that I strive to be. A couple months ago, I got a message from a former student at a community college where I taught. He said, Mrs. Warnock, 
I just wanted to say thank you. A long time ago, you literally took me by the hand and walked me to CIFAR. You knew I'd be too nervous to go, so you took it upon yourself to take me. Since that day, I've been on track, slowly and surely, to earn a degree. Last week, wrapped up the winter term. With it being my last term, I was extremely nervous about checking my grades. Today I checked them, and well, I passed. I'm set to finally graduate community college. When I walked Jesus to that support center, I wasn't thinking about how to get him through my class. I knew I could do that. I was thinking about how to equalize his opportunity for success in all of his classes and show him I expected him to finish no matter what it took and who he had to ask for help. Sometimes planting future seeds works. Sometimes it's really hard because we don't always know the outcome. Remember, it was 20 years before Mr. Woodworth heard about my success, and that alternative school teacher never heard. Recently, a student I've been working closely with lost their way. I came home crying, racking my brain for that one more thing that I could do to help get them back on track. And my husband said the hard words that he's had to say to me before. Honey, you've done everything you could. You can't save them all. And he's right. I can't. But if we all look past the poverty to see the potential, if we take the extra time to walk or drive that person to the support center, if we look up a phone number and a name and sit with them while they make that really hard call. If we help them identify their strengths and then show them where to put it on a job application or a scholarship application, we can save them all. I know because future seeds helped me write an end to that old song in a way that my 17-year-old self could only have imagined. I believe someday we'll all expect the best of us and I believe that one day we will work together to heal what's left of us. In this I find the strength to carry on And no amount of loss Can kill a hope so strong